never use the drive through They always screw you at the drive through Sound advice there from Leo Getz, the character played by Joe Pesci in the Lethal Weapon series. And, well, while that may be a good rule to live by, there's a world of difference between getting the wrong order and what happened to the protagonist in tonight's story. Now, my dear friends, I've got a little surprise for you after this, so stick around after the end of this story. I do so beg you. <laughs> well, you know what time it is. It's time to sit back and relax with your favourite drink. And... Listen. My name is Cassandra. I like to think of myself as above the rank and file of most people, but it's all part of that veneer of confidence that everyone uses to hide how terrified of life they really are. I just moved to a town in California, nestled in a valley near the ocean, to go to university there. Now, if you're near there, you know the place. A stone's throw from some of the best clam chowder in the world. Now, I really wish I'd have gone for the clam chowder instead of the drive through I was homeschooled, you see. Stop. No, it wasn't like that. My parents arranged playdates with other kids. I made friends pretty easily, but I've always been more introverted. Not that I don't mind the company of time-weathered friends, but, well, here I was. New home, new state, far from my usual friends and the family I so loved. But I had freedom. I had a car. <laughs> She's pretty nice. A dark blue sedan I got for a song for the money I made in 4-H, selling my show animals. Rabbits, mostly. You'd be surprised how much a well-bred bunny can go for in the right markets. Show-quality animals can go for $500 a bunny. Oh, the worst night of my life came out of the blue. I studied extensively, but the cellular biology degree I was pursuing was proving challenging. So, once again, I found myself at my desk, in my dorm, at one in the morning, and realizing that I hadn't had dinner. The rumble of my stomach interrupted my research on viral behavior, and with a groan of irritation, I lifted myself from my desk and went to the kitchen of my dorm block. My three roommates were all different, and I couldn't stand two of them. One of them, an activist who never met a core she didn't immediately attach herself to, and rammed down our throats. The other was there on a pageant scholarship, and she was going on a general education run until she could, and I quote, oh, like, find myself and what I want to uh, do with my life, or whatever. The third girl, Gloria, I got along with pretty well. Very overweight, a real classical goth in style, but chipper as a basket of sunshine in her personal dealings. And it was her who I found fishing out the last bit of food from the fridge. She paused, seeing me, staring forlornly at the fridge. Oh, sorry, Cassie. I didn't know you were up. Do you want some? She inquired with a guilty frown, offering me the paper plate with the soggy burrito resting on it. In my hungered state, it looked like it could have come out of Gordon Ramsay's kitchen, but in my perpetual state of mild social anxiety, I didn't want to ruffle any feathers even though it was clear Gloria was trying to do the same. No, that's okay. Francine hasn't touched that thing in two days, and you got to it first. I'll get drive through I dismissively squeaked, blithely waving my hand. Are you sure, Cassie? She chirped, head arching. I smiled. You go ahead. But you've got shopping duty tomorrow, okay? <sighs> You're the best. I'll get the good stuff, Gloria exclaimed in a hushed tone respectful of our other two roommates' slumber. I strolled outside, the orchestra of crickets washing over me at the same time the cool, coastal night wind met my skin. Halfway to the parking lot, I realized I was still in my slippers, the ones that looked like dachshund puppies, and the long pink nightshirt, not a scrap else. <sighs> Thank you, scatterbrain. Purse in hand, I hesitated but ultimately decided on going. 
I didn't want to waste precious time since I'd need to capitalize on whatever sleep time I had left. I got into my car, settling into the cool leather seat, and pulled out. I hadn't been out often, and the drive to town was about ten minutes. I began to explore around, looking for a colourful beacon of illuminated advertisement, promising delicious, thoroughly unhealthy meals. I finally found one. Indie burger joint it looked like, but the first place I saw that was open. I fished a $20 bill from the wallet in my purse and took a deep breath, pulling up behind a bulky white SUV, which was behind two other cars. <sighs> Busy night. I rolled down my window, biting my lip apprehensively. One of the reasons I could afford the car was because, well, it had some issues. Like rolling down the window, for some reason, triggered the door locks. I groaned in irritation as they audibly clicked open. Irrational fears flooded my mind as my eyes darted to the dark, rustling shrubs and the tree line nearby that marked the line between civilization and miles of trackless mountain forest. <sighs> Too much noise for an animal to come near. They don't like cars. I chided myself. Another car pulled up behind me. <sighs> this idiot had his brights on. <sighs> what joy. I flipped my rearview mirror up shaking my head and waving my hand disapprovingly, and immediately stopped. Jeez, what if he's a killer? What if he's a grouch? I shouldn't make him angry. I groaned inwardly at myself. <laughs> right, if I had those odds, I'd be a lottery winner right now. I resumed my agitated hand gestures and he flicked his lights on and off, indicating they weren't brights at all just the stupid LEDs. You know, the kind that blind you at night when you pass on the road, because they're bright enough to be seen from space. Yes, those kind. I waited in line, and reached for my purse, for my phone, to screw around with it to pass the time, only to remember exactly where I'd left it. Put it on the desk, so I wouldn't forget to take it with me. Yeah, thanks again, Scatterbrain, I grumbled. I reached for the radio. It was tuned to all the stations back home. But, well, I figured I might find one of those stupid late-night conspiracy theory talk shows to amuse myself with while I waited. They could regale me with stories of a spaceship hidden under the pyramids. Oh, how some people are actually space aliens who introduced the concept of the tree of life to us. Or, <laughs> my personal favourite, the cryptids. You know, unexplained monster sightings. It was finally my turn to place an order. The speaker looked older than my car. I studied the menu, found what I wanted, and waited for the person on the other end of the speaker to ask me for my order. I saw another car pull in behind Bright Light Sky. Well, I was well and truly boxed in now. I fidgeted, feeling more vulnerable than I wanted to. As soon as I placed the order, I planned on rolling up my window so the doors would lock again, and so I'd have that thin, transparent, fragile sheet of protective armour between myself and the outside. I kept waiting, realising the radio was just hissing static. I frowned, cycling through the stations. County reminds everyone to remain in their homes and lock their doors, and to call the Sheriff's Department if there's any attempt made to commit forced entry with two victims already found in the woods with no clothes. Can I take your order? Oh, Jesus Christ. Timing. I turned off the radio, lips trembling at the snippet I'd heard. Uh, I'd like the number three combo, please. Um, medium diet cola, I chattered. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? The speaker cheerfully crackled. A very sunny-sounding young man. God, if I wasn't terrified out of my skull right now. Jeez. Yeah, I'd like a number three combo, please. Medium with diet cola, I repeated, trying to juggle hiding my terror and irritation at the same time. Combo three, medium with a diet cola. That'll be $7.40, the speaker recited. 
Thank you, I mumbled, then rolled up my window, hearing the locks comfortingly click. I relaxed a little, reaching for the radio. A reminder to all residents to stay in your homes and lock your doors and windows until the sheriff's department concludes the manhunt. Two victims have been found so far. Tracy White and Ginger Ferdinand. Bodies bleached pale white, seemingly to conceal evidence and left in the woods. Sexual trauma is apparently evident in... Oh God. Oh God, oh God. Did some sick monster watch a horror movie and decide to emulate it? I reached for the radio again to turn it back on, wanting to learn more, but worried I would work myself up into a fit. There I was, dachshund and slippers and a long nightshirt with nothing else. I fumbled in my purse for the taser my mother had given me before I'd left for university. Jeez, God damn it. Why can't they make these purses practical? I yelled, dumping out the contents onto the passenger seat. A pack of gum, my parking pass, my student ID, my wallet, bundles of receipts, and a phone number from someone I met at a party a few nights ago, and my taser. I clutched it tightly, kissing the handle gratefully, before setting it down on the seat again. Thanks, Mom, I whispered wiping my eyes of the nervous tears that had flooded my eyes during my desperate search. I didn't know how long all of that had taken, but to my immense unhappiness, the line hadn't moved at all. I rolled down my window again. The locks clicked into the unlocked position once more. Hello? I'm sorry, but is there a delay? I asked. Nothing but static replied. Hello? Static. Nothing but. I frowned again and rolled up my window. Why would it be static and not just quiet? The line finally moved and I let out a whimper of relief, body relaxing. The white SUV in front of me was at the window and I could see an arm extending from it to an arm from the restaurant window. <laughs> Stupid idiot. Everything's fine, I admonished myself. The cops will catch whoever they're hunting and life will go on. I'll get my degree, go into STEM, oh, meet a nice man, have lots of kids in a big house and live happily ever after. I watched the restaurant's window extend a hand, bag held, passed to the SUV. It pulled forward and I saw the road beyond it. Ah, oh, freedom. Well, just as soon as I had my food. I rolled down the window again, and again the locks clicked open. There was a lady in a white, chef-like outfit at the window with a headset on. Weird. I thought it was a man on the other end of the speaker. She had a huge grin on her face. <laughs> Probably a tweaker, I guessed. That'll be seven dollars and forty cents she exclaimed. I handed her a twenty, and after some fuss with the cash register, she handed me my change. The brown paper bag containing the intoxicating aroma of hot junk food flooded the cabin of my car as I accepted it. It was, well, the most delicious smell I'd ever whiffed. She passed me a generic white cup with my soda. Um, uh, I must have mixed it up. Could you make sure that's diet? she asked. I rolled my eyes and sampled the soda. Diet. Uh, it's fine, thanks, I said. Suddenly, Mr. Brightlights began to honk his horn erratically. I scowled. Yeah, I'm done, you jerk, I yelled out of the window. The lady in the restaurant window never lost her smile as I pulled out and onto the road. Mr. Brights followed me from behind, skipping the drive through window. God, I squeaked, then tore down the road, flooring it. And Mr. Brights followed right after me, honking like a madman still, flashing his lights on and off. I felt my heart skip a beat as I drove through a parking lot nearby, then down a short strip mall's parking, using a little shortcut I knew from the times I'd gone out. 
I finally lost the crazy bastard and found my way back to the road leading through the woods and back to the university. I panted as I drove, trying to calm myself. <sighs> nice driving, baby girl. I think that asshole saw me climb into your car. Must have called the cops by now. The aroma in the car turned to ozone. My beating heart felt like it was pumping ice, and my stomach gurgled in distress as the voice, whispering warmly against my ear, broke the mortified silence. I felt hands rest on my neck and shoulders, kneading with almost careful gentleness. Take the next left. The one that leads into the woods. <sighs> Got some place special I want to take you. I heard sloshing as well. My rearview mirror was still turned from before. I noticed a few gallons of bleach resting on the rear seat next to him. Oh no. In the state of terror I was in, I did as I was told. Meekly obeying the stranger in the back of my car in my space, touching me. I saw a camper van at the end of the road and a portable bathtub sitting outside of it. My eyes settled on the taser, still resting on the passenger seat. He must have noticed some change in my demeanor because he reached up, grabbing my hair and pulling back. My hand lanced out, wrapping around the taser the second I felt a damp cloth seal over my mouth. I woke up to hear shouting. I was lifted out of the same portable tub I'd seen, bleach running off my bare form as I stumbled out, skin red and irritated and noticeably paler. My lungs burned from the vapor, but I breathed. I saw a man lying dead on the ground. Perfectly ordinary looking person. Brown jacket, blue shirt, jeans. Normal face, with a clean-shaven look. His face was twisted in agony, hands clutching his chest. I learned later that my taser attack had exacerbated a heart condition he had, and when he became excited, he experienced a heart attack before he could take me. The police found me because Mr. Brights, who, as I later learned, was another student from the university, a vintner student by the name of Harold Brown, had called the police and trailed me as long as he could. It was because of him that I was alive. I'm going out with him next week. But when the police came to interview me in the hospital about my ordeal, they wanted to know a lot about the woman at the drive through the kidnapper's accomplice. I couldn't remember much, save for that horrible smile. She's still out there, and ever since that night, I've slept with a taser under my pillow, and my doors and windows locked. I've taken up self-defense because I refuse to let this dead monster's partner haunt my mind. Regardless, one thing's for certain, I am never using a drive through again. You know what? Thank you. Thank you for coming back time and time again and listening to me tell stories. Now, as a lot of you know, this really is just a hobby for me, but it's getting to the point where I could realistically, in another three or four years, <laughs> pack in the day job and do this full time. And with that in mind, um, I've started setting up my second channel because, well, let's face it, YouTube is an enigma in itself and none of us know how it works. So just to make sure that things keep ticking over. I'm now focusing on my second channel or two. Um, it's going to be shorter stories and the music I share for now. And to give you a little taster, I've um, tagged on a story to the end of this one. So you can get a little idea about what the second channel will be all about. Okay, so stick around. I've got another five minutes of story for you coming up right now. <laughs>
I was sitting in my bed around 1am, as I normally do, when I could have sworn I saw my reflection in the dresser mirror move on its own. As the paranoid, stressed out loony of the family, I started carefully watching my reflection. I tried to trick it into moving on its own, by looking away only to quickly turn back to catch it off guard, but alas, this didn't work. I'd almost given up, till I saw, out of the corner of my eye, movement. I quickly turned around only to see once again, it matched my every movement. Then, I thought of the idea to record it with my phone while my back was turned. <laughs> During those 15 minutes, nothing happened. Not a single thing was out of place. So, I gave up completely and went to sleep. The following night was more or less uneventful, with me completely forgetting about the previous night's events. Little did I know, the thing moving wasn't my reflection. It was the creature made up of slimy, vein-like strings in the shape of a human, with an odd, crying, shattered mask on the ceiling, crawling slowly towards me. As it did so, I closed my eyes, not realizing what was happening. Then an odd, painful sensation took hold of me, as it dropped down on me. Opening my eyes, I screamed for help as it sunk its tendrils into my legs. It began to drain me of flesh and dig more of its worm-like veins into me. Soon, it had dug at least four tendrils into each of my limbs, with more shooting out of what was once its humanoid body, now a mass of veins floating in the air. It then began to envelop me into itself, wrapping its remaining worm-like strings around my body. That's when my father came in with an axe and began wildly swinging at the beast as it nearly finished with me. As my dad continued, the four fragmented parts of the mask began to cover my face along with the tendrils beneath them. And I found myself getting up without my control and listened in horror as I killed my own father. As the creature finished him off, I felt a sudden mass enter my body where flesh once was. I realized in fear that the tendrils had begun to fill my now skeleton-like body, replacing my flesh and muscle. Then I felt my remaining body parts finally disappearing, leaving only my brain and eyes behind inside a mass of tendrils, now having retaken the form of a humanoid. As it walked into my sister's room, and climbed onto the ceiling. I felt myself fade away as it had finished digesting my brain. Hey there. Thank you so much for taking the time to drop by and listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me. I put a lot of time and effort into making these videos, so it's nice to know that there's someone out there listening. Do me a little favor, would you? Click that like button, leave a comment, and if you really feel like it, why not subscribe too? Okay, happy tales everyone. See you soon.